Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bert Dicht, I'm Vice President of Membership for the National Space Society. And on behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, and also the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society, I'd like to welcome you to our space forum tonight, the Webb Space Telescope, the first light machine. And we really appreciate you joining us. I know it's a, a new year. I don't know when the expiration date happens for when you say Happy New Year, but I will say Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, and this is our first space forum of 2022. And we're looking forward to a lot of exciting presentations uh, in the coming year. What I'd like to do is just go through the agenda real quick. We talk about our virtual etiquette. Got a few NSS announcements. Uh, I'll be talking about the next space forum that's coming up. Uh, and then we'll get right into our program and then we'll close for the evening. So in terms of submitting a question, uh, it is best to use the Q&A function. That can be seen only by the panelists and it's much easier to pick out the questions. You certainly can use the chat function uh, to put a question in, but remember it can get mixed up with all the other things that are in chat. I would ask you to be very respectful of the panelists and the audience because everyone can see that. And it would be best if you are viewing this in speaker mode once we start the actual presentation. Uh, that way you can focus in on the speaker and the slides that are up on the screen. We did get a lot of questions that were submitted. Uh, I know that our speaker has them uh, and a lot of those questions will be answered in the presentation. We'll see the best we can do uh, to get as many uh, answered after the session's over. So please feel free to put your questions in as well. And again, we'll try to get to them uh, as many as we possibly can. I just want to give you a, what is new with the National Space Society. Uh, I think one of our last sessions, we talked about the, the NSS Career Center, that it was coming. And actually it is live now. Uh, and we're working to get a lot of space jobs in there. So it is a, it's a benefit of membership that you'll have a little access to that. Uh, and it gives you some advantages if you'd like to take a look at that. We also have the New Space Journal. That's a journal for space entrepreneurs. Uh, and you can have unlimited online access through our inside nss.org system, our membership portal. Feel free to, if you're not a member, to join NSS, go to space.nss.org slash join. And also our website is space.nss.org. So we look forward to a lot of involvement and engagement with our members. I always uh, encourage you to give uh, to our cause. Uh, so if you're enjoying programming like this in the space forums, town halls, please feel free to make a donation to support NSS. Uh, you can go.nss.org slash donate dash now. I will put that link into our uh, into the chat so you can have that as well. And finally, for just some of our initial announcements, please complete uh, the post space forum survey. It only takes a few minutes. It's going to take you right there. The survey is anonymous and it really helps us in terms of planning future events and getting feedback so we can improve what we're presenting to you. Uh, the next space forum is going to be on the 27th, two weeks from tonight. We've got a really interesting presentation with uh, Gene Wright and Dr. Ken Kramer of Space Up Close. They're both longtime space professionals. It's called Eyewitness to Launch Operations, and they both cover quite a few launches. What you're seeing there today in that one image is today's launch of the Falcon 9, and in that upper right is actually the landing of the first stage. Uh, and they've just taken some amazing pictures. They're going to be sharing what they're doing at the Space Center, tracking everything, everything from the launches to the SLS. So we hope you can join us in a couple of weeks. And we're working on the February, March schedule. So we hope to share a little bit more with you as we go forward. What I'd like to do now is just turn it over real quickly to one of my NSS colleagues, uh, Aggie Cobran, who's just going to talk about an event that's coming up on Sunday that you might be interested in. Aggie? Thank you, Bert, and, and hello to everybody, and it's wonderful to see over 200 people on this call, 234 to be exact right now. 
Um, I just wanted to take a minute and let you know that on Sunday the 16th, which is this coming Sunday, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 noon Eastern time, we're going to do a whole day of space content. This is a combination of all sorts of things that we've done in the past from a number of different uh, arenas. It's, it's space, it's innovation, uh, as well as other things. It is free for everybody to watch. It will be on E360 TV as well as several of the social media platforms. And um, we are sending out information on that. I've got it. Uh, I think Fred just put it up on, as a link. Uh, it'll be on Facebook and several other places. So I would wanted to welcome everybody. Um, we're going to have a great eight hours of space content coming from a number of different sources, including a lot of uh, NSS content and, and other groups. So please join us if you can. Thank you, Bert. Appreciate Thank you, Aggie. Time. Looks like a great event. Hopefully, everyone can join us uh, for all of it or part of it uh, on Sunday. And then so it'll what be I want to do? Oh, questions? Just, just going to yeah. say it's going to stay up beyond that too. So if you can't join us Sunday, it will be there beyond that. Thanks. Oh, great. Thanks, Aggie. So what I'd like to do now, uh, just before we start our presentation, uh, because we're kicking off the new year, is just give a a short welcome from our NSS leadership. Uh, and what I'm going to do now uh, is I'm going to stop sharing for a second and uh, first turn this over to uh, Anita Gale, our NSS CEO and chair of the executive committee. Uh, Anita. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Uh, you are enjoying tonight one of my absolutely favorite benefits, membership benefits of NSS. Now, actually, um, th these space forums were conceived only a few, um, what, like two years ago. Uh, really is a, a, a COVID thing. And we're going to keep them going because we absolutely love these and, and sharing this information with our members. Now, you don't need to be a member to enjoy space forums, but the uh, National Space Society officers are working on developing more member benefits. You, Bert in, introduced some of the center is coming, uh, the access to the new space journal, uh, there are more exciting new membership, mem membership benefits that we're working on, but for most of them, you, well, like those two, you, you can only benefit from those if you are a member of the National Space Society. So we do encourage you to join our mission, join with us, become members, and you will see some very exciting and fun stuff coming up in the next year or so. So um, thank you so much. Welcome, enjoy, um, and um, turn it over to uh, back to Bert. Thank you so much, Anita. And now it's also my great pleasure to introduce our NSS president, Michelle Hanlon. Michelle? Thank you, Bert. And thank you, Bert and Larry, for putting these together. These are amazing. I want to say thank you, Dr. Stahl, for joining us. Um, you certainly gave us a wonderful Christmas present um, in 2021, and you are um, helping us open 2022 brilliantly. Um, and we are all really excited to hear from you. So I am not going to talk for long. I just want to say um, I'm a policy person. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Don't cringe. Um, but I really love the, um, this, uh, the partnership um, that James Webb is, you know, with the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency. But what, what is really important to me and what I think is really hopeful for 2022 is that you are going to supply um, the whole world, the whole of humanity with just unimaginable, invaluable data and observations. And um, we are so excited. And I just it's going to be a wonderful, hopefully introspective opportunity for us to really think about uh, our place in the cosmos um, next year, this year and beyond. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us um, to I know that we've I've seen Australia, New Zealand and um, Canada and uh, a lot of different states. Um, and so we've, we're really thrilled with this, the reach that we're having. And uh, we hope you continue to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. Everybody, I'm going to go back to sharing real quick. And uh, before I introduce our, our speaker, I just want to uh, also announce I'm going to be joined tonight in moderating the questions by our, our Ad Astra editor, Rod Pyle, my, my fellow NSS colleagues. So Rod, thank you for joining us. And we'll hear from Rod as we, uh, as we get through the program. So now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. And uh, Dr. Philip Stahl, who is the senior optical physicist at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. And what he's currently doing, he's leading a study to mature these mirror technologies for uh, a new large aperture telescope to replace Hubble. So previously, he was responsible for developing the candidate primary mirror technologies 
for the Webb Space Telescope. So he'll be talking a lot about that tonight, both from an engineering and science standpoint. So it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Stahl. So we're happy to have you tonight. Uh, Dr. Stahl, it is all yours. All righty. Um, so welcome to everybody from around the world. Let's see, am I sharing, have you seen, am I sharing the right? Uh, yes. Okay, um, so a little bit more about me. I was uh, recruited uh, to join NASA in uh, 1999. I was, uh, at the time I was working in the Space Space Laser Program, I'd been uh, doing that for about four or five years. And um, uh, part of the reason why NASA recruited me is, is that I, uh, in previous lives, I had figured out how to, to test the Keck mirror segments. And so I had a lot of experience on segment after telescopes. Plus I had uh, in, inside the space space laser program, I was working on with the, uh, the lamp mirror, which is a four meter um, seven segment aperture telescope that we, was hooked up to a, bar, a large laser in a vacuum chamber. Um, and I had made the, I uh, was responsible for the secondary mirror for the, for the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, my background is I'm, uh, I've got a PhD in optics out of Arizona and I, uh, my expertise was in how to test things. And so I'm, I'm a, a technologist. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an astronomer. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about astronomy and science to the best of my knowledge. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm uh, a technologist at heart. And in fact, I got an email a couple of days ago from a colleague of mine in Germany um, who, who summarized it very well is, is that uh, my job was to believe that we could make the web telescope when it was still just an idea and to turn that idea into reality. And, and so I'm gonna speak with you a little bit tonight about uh, some of that uh, journey, some of that experience, some of the technology that we developed and then the science behind why uh, we did what we did. And then I have uh, some pretty pictures. So, so Webb the Webb telescope is going to be NASA's or is NASA's largest uh, astronomical space telescope. It's uh, dwarfing everything else that's up there. It's a primary science is to look for the first uh, light of the universe. Uh, the, the, the first light that was emitted by the first objects to uh, you know the first stars and also to look for the formation and assembly of galaxies, the formation of planetary systems, and to look uh, at the habitability and, and study planetary systems, possibly looking for habitable exoplanets. It was uh, specifically designed, um, the, when I walked into the program in 1999, uh, the design requirements, the science requirements uh, required us to develop new technologies and fabrication process, ways to make the telescope, ways to test the telescope and uh, invent these new things. Um, and so tonight I'm going to, uh, this lecture, I'll give you some of the science and some of the engineering that went into it. So the primary science is first light. So what is first light? And, and what it is is about the, uh, the first luminous objects and how they uh, deionized or reionized the, uh, the, the universe. And so after the Big Bang, we have particles and they create atoms um, and, and protons and electrons, which then form into hydrogen. So at the universe, early universe is just nothing, nothing but hydrogen. And, uh, and then we have this zone where we can't see what's going on with telescopes. You know, everybody's fam familiar with the map and WFER map. They looked at the cosmic microwave background in Kobe. And Webb's gonna look at this region here, which we call it the cosmic dark zone. And the key question here is the ionization of the universe. So when the universe is just neutral hydrogen, um, any light that got emitted got absorbed. And so these first stars that form due to you know, fluctuations in gravity and pull together enough hydrogen to, to turn into a star, as the, those stars create bubbles in this fog, and as the fog slowly clears, the universe uh, slowly becomes ionized. And when it's fully ionized, then it's transparent. And the, when, the way we see that 
is when the universe is ionized, you can't see anything but maybe a couple of spectral lines. And as the universe becomes, when it's neutral, and as the universe becomes more and more ionized, now you can see more and more spectral lines. So one of the things we do is we look at is with the spectrometers, we're going to look at these spectral lines further back. And so when we see objects where it's patchy in their spectral coverage, we know that they're somewhere inside this fog of neutral uh, hydrogen. And the first stars are going to be 100% hydrogen, and, and they tend to be huge. They're thousands of times bigger and than our own star. And because they are so big, they don't last very long. They blow up, they, they go supernova. And, and, and when they explode, then that's when you create uh, things like helium and, and uh, heavy metal, uh, things like carbon and other things. And so, you know, this is an O here. We are a G class sun, and here's an O, and you get an idea O is only 25 times larger. So if you have things that are a thousand times larger, there's going to be absolutely huge. And the way we look for these things, the other way, in addition to looking at the spe patchy spectra, is redshift. So here's an example of uh, some Hubble data, you know, nothing in the blue or the green, but in the red. So this object is redshifted. And, and why we have redshift is, is that um, the further away objects are uh, from us, the more they're redshifted. And, and a lot of people think that is like a Doppler effect but no, it's not a Doppler effect. It's actually a space-time stretching effect is that when the light was emitted from the objects very far away in the blue, the universe is smaller. And as the light comes to us and the universe expands, then, um, then that light uh, gets stretched. And so as it gets stretched, it gets into the red. So an object that's very close to us, say the spectral, the, these are the, the star uh, Fraunhofer lines. And the further away you get, the same spectral lines get shifted into the infrared. So while Hubble does a lot of science that's in close to us in the visible and the ultraviolet, um, the web's going to basically do the same science, but that's why it's got to be in the infrared, because the light's been shifted into the infrared. And uh, so one of the things in is these first live objects is what are the first galaxies? So this is the Hubble Deep Field. So inside the Hubble Deep Field, there's this very red shifted object over here that's uh, say about 500 million years after the Big Bang, um, maybe one of the oldest galaxies that we've seen. And it would, did not show up in any of the original three Hubble few, uh, spectral bands, but when the, we added the near infrared camera, uh, so there it is, you can see it in the near infrared camera of Hubble. And so the web uh, mission is to study the origin and elevation, uh, evolution of galaxies, stars, planetary systems. This first light is optimized for near infrared uh, wavelengths from 0.6 microns to 28 microns. Um, it was, has, the, it is re the requirement is a five year mission life with a 10 year goal. We put enough fuel into it for 15 or 20 years. And in fact, the feedback we get is that the launch was so perfect and so precise and that the Ariana 5 um, put it onto the exact right trajectory with the exact right C3 is they're not gonna have to use any fuel in order to drop Webb into its orbit at L2. So we're gonna have basically a completely full uh, fuel uh, load, which should give us a uh, 10, uh, 15 to 20 years, which is really good is that the mean time between failure for instruments in low earth orbit is about five, five and a half years. But you know, we're finding is that the, uh, the radiation environment out at L2 is so benign that uh, instruments can last a, a much longer. So we, we're looking forward to a very long lifetime. Goddard Space Flight Center was the uh, lead mission. We had international collaboration from the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. Northrop Grumman is the prime contractor. So there are four science instruments, near infrared camera, or the NIRCAM, the University of Arizona is the lead with participation from Lockheed. The near infrared spectrometer, uh, near spec ESA was the lead. And then the mid infrared instrument, the MIRI has JPL with ESA contribu contribution. And then the Canadian Space Agency provided the fine guidance sensor. And, and inside the fine guidance sensor is also a narrow field uh, planetary camera uh, with a coronagraph. And Space Telescope Institute at John Hopkins at the space uh, um, will be running the telescope. So NASA's fundamental questions are, how did we get here? Where are we going? Are we alone? Everything, so, you know, Webb's a $10 billion mission. The telescope itself is about 1.2 billion. I, I often say it's a lot of fun to spend a billion dollars, 
but we don't get to spend a billion dollars just because it's fun. It has to relate to the science. And so these are the science questions that guide everything we do at NASA. And so the web is we start with the Big Bang. We look for the first light. We're going to look at galaxy formation, galaxy evolution, planetary formation, star formation, and then hopefully even uh, look at a little bit of life. So the key th three key factors that uh, require that are driven by science is and, and that also drive all the engineering is it's a space telescope. It's an infrared telescope and it's really big. And so those are the things that drive the engineering. And so why do we go to space? We got to go to space because we want to look in the near infrared and, and it has to do with atmospheric propagation. So if we're looking in this region from a you know point from the red end of the visible out to you know a quarter micron, the atmosphere is not very uh, transparent. So we have to get above the atmosphere. You have to get above the atmosphere also for the uh, for X-ray and ultraviolet. And that's why you know radio wave. We don't have to go to space for radio wave, but any of the far infrared we have to get into space. And so this is like the discovery space is that. You know, for ground, Hubble's better than eight meter class ground based telescopes, but once we get to 30 meter class ground based telescopes, you know, Hubble will be less useful. Here is CERTIF, which is only, you know, less than a meter. So, Webb is going to just acquire, you know, huge sensitivity in space. You're a technical audience, you know what infrared light is. But why do we do infrared? So, this is a very famous picture taken by Hubble. It's called the Pillars of Creation. Um, and and uh, this is in the visible. And this is what the same area looks like in the infrared taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Is infrared, you can see inside the dust, you see what's actually going on. So how big is Webb? Uh, it's, it's big. Uh, the, the, the sun shades about the size of a tennis court. The, uh, the telescope itself about the size of a two-story house. And why do we need it so big? Is that aperture gives you sensitivity. You know, so we started out with, you know, when Galileo, you know, built his little telescope, you can see the, the moons of Jupiter. And, and as we get to bigger and bigger telescopes and more sensitive detectors, we get to better and better sensitivity and Webb's gonna be even more sensitive than Hubble. So by comparison, Webb is going to be about six times more sensitive than Hubble uh, based upon just the aperture alone. Uh, want to look at the field of view. So you see Hubble's field of view is about 100 by 100 milliarc seconds at, uh, and it's got a land over D at 1.6 microns and 0.14 uh, milliarc seconds at two lambda over, at, at two microns, Webb's lambda over D resolution is going to be half of Hubble's. So Webb actually at the same wavelength has much better resolution. The field of view of Webb is going to be, uh, about the same, if you know, a little bit wider than Hubble. When we get into the visible, um, it's it's a little bit smaller, but that's because it's a bigger telescope. Uh, by comparison, Spitzer, which is only a tenth of a meter, is is got a very large uh, field of view, three times you know bigger than 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 Hubble. Um, but then look at its resolution. So it's you know at, at 5.6 microns, it's it's two arc seconds. You know, so it's it's a big difference. And this down here shows you overlap. You know, Hubble will over has some overlap. Webb has some overlap in this Spitzer. And this is the uh, the way it works: is that we have a hot side and a cold side. The spacecraft is on the hot side, and then each layer of the sunshade drops the temperature of the telescope by about 50 degrees Kelvin. So that on the cold side, we're at uh, we get down to uh, so the goal, the requirement was for the telescope to be uh, below 50 Kelvin. And uh, we don't necessarily know what it's going to get to, but it's going to be really cold. And then this is an illustration of how do you put a six meter telescope into a four meter fairing? Uh, well, you have to fold it up. And, and I, I like to explain it's sort of like a drop leaf table like your grandmother uh, might have had. And it's going to a Sun Earth L2 point, which is one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth, or about three times further out than the moon. And here's uh, the only pictures, you know, I worked on the telescope. And so here's the only pictures of the science instruments that I've got in the talk. And this is the near cam, the near spec, the MIRI, and then this is the, the fine guidance sensor and the near infrared imagery and spectra of exoplanets uh, camera. 
Um, the requirements on web, 25 square meter collecting area, uh, two micron diffraction limit, operating temperature I said below 50 Kelvin, primary mirror tip to tip is, um, and, and the goal was about 6 million per square meter. It's made up of 18 hex segments and two rings. And uh, each segment is about 1.3 microns or meters in diameter. Each segment was specified to be better than 20 nanometers. And then we had a breakdown in terms of the air budget in terms of low order, mid spatial, and high spatial. And again, you're a technical audience, you know nanometers are really small. So this one chart summarizes uh, almost everything I did for like six years. <clears throat> So when I uh, was hired to work uh, to work this problem in 1999, the state of the art was basically Hubble aerial density was up around 200 and some kilograms per meter squared. There were some Department of Defense telescopes that were in the 50 kilograms per meter squared. This is the Spitzer uh, Space Telescope, which was about 27, 28 kilograms per meter squared. And, and when they hired me in 99, we wanted to make this an eight meter class telescope. And because of mass constraints of the launch vehicle, they needed to get down uh, into the 15 kilograms per meter squared regime. So we were looking, it was really all about aerial density, aerial density. And then based upon the lessons learned, from uh, other previous missions with regards to Hubble and Chandra, uh, we needed to mature the technology on how do you build this stuff to TRL-6 as early as possible. And so we started by a, a program called the sub, uh, Subscale Brilliant Mirror Demonstration. And we started, NASA started spending money on, on then what was then called NGST, the Next Generation Space Telescope in 96. And we started with the SMD uh, per, uh, activity. There's SM, SBMD, that's a half meter brilliant mirror, 20 meter radius, and it was just a sphere. And then we funded eight, uh, we funded um, an AMSD phase one, where we had, uh, actually, I think that's, I think we had actually originally eight different phase one vendors and then five different vendors. And then for phase two, we down selected to four different architectures. And then we down selected to three. So these are the three. The Goodyear, there was a Goodyear glass mirror, there was a Kodak glass mirror, and then Ball Brilliant mirror. And, and one of the things with this phase, I want to say is from a management standpoint, this phased down select competition, I, want, I believe that the fastest, lowest cost way to mature technology is by competition. Humans are innately uh, competitive animals. Um, but the key thing in order to make competition work is there has to be consequences. And so, you know, as I said earlier, we had had four architectures, which we down selected to three. Well, then after we selected the prime contractor, we eliminated one. And, and by having it, this as a down select with, with people getting thrown off the island, if you will, it, it really keeps everybody focused on what the goal is. So it's the they, they, they're competing as hard as they can to mature the technology as fast as possible. And, and then it turned out that when we went to the competition to select the final flight mirror, both of these companies put uh, enough incentives on the table for us to select their mirror that it completely paid for the entire competition of the program. And, and that never would have happened, I don't think, if we had uh, down selected too early. So I believe in competition and keeping uh, uh, that going forward. So we did eventually then down select to the uh, ball beryllium mirror. And then what we built is we built an engineering development unit and we, we tested that uh, to TRL six uh, and, and then presented it to a non-advocate review, which said, yes, verily you are ready to, uh, to move into to phase AB. And the reason that we went with beryllium is that it's really stiff. Um, that's one of the reasons it's got a low mass. But the other reason is that once you get below 100 Kelvin, its CTE is virtually zero. Um, so, uh, and, and with glass, that's not the case. And this is where an example is really important is looking at the change in the shape of the mirror between 30 and 55K. So again, I said earlier that the mirror specified to be operating below 55K. Well, the bottom of the mirror closest to the sunshade may be about 50K, but the top of the mirror might be at 30K or 20K. And, and we're not going to actively heat these mirrors. We're gonna let them passively cool. And so we don't really necessarily know exactly what the temperature of the mirror is. And so with the brilliant mirror is that 
over that temperature range, the brilliant mirror had a total change of only seven nanometers RMS. And, and if you remember, what was the requirement? It was 20 nanometers. Uh, whereas the glass mirror, the ULE mirror, has a 20 nanometer RMS change over, the, over that temperature range. So the, if you were to go with the glass mirror, the only way you're going to meet the 20 nanometer RMS specification was if we actively uh, controlled the temperature of the mirror. But with the brilliant mirror, because the CT is completely flat, over the entire possible range of temperatures, all we had to do is get the mirror to the right shape at one of the temperatures and it'll be good at any of the other temperatures. And so this is a, 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 the fabrication that the blanks, these are billets uh, that were manufactured by Brush Wellman up in uh, Elmore, uh, um, Ohio, uh, about 15 uh, uh, miles down the road from my family farm. And then we cut these up and uh, 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 into those uh, blank for the primary mirror, the secondary mirror, the tertiary mirror, and some of the structural elements. And, and Axis, uh, it, we went down to Axis, uh, Coleman, Alabama, to do the lightweight machining, shaping the mirror, and then out to Tinsley, where they're polished, and then ball aerospace, where they were assembled in to, together with the back structure. Um, lightweight machining, say, that's 250 kilograms down to 20 kilograms. Here's some pretty pictures out at Tinsley of the, the polished mirrors. And uh, one of the questions that I get a lot is, you know, how did we make sure that the mirrors were made right? Well, I mean, that was my job. I was hired to make sure that these mirrors were made right. And the way that we did it is we had redundant test setups. So we had two test setups side by side and that the mirrors had to get the same answer in both. We had independent tests at Tinsley and um, uh, an independent test at Tinsley that in measured the uh, prescription in an entirely different way, autocollimation test. And we had independent center curvature tests uh, at Ball Aerospace and Marshall, and we had to get the exact same answers in all cases. Plus we did final uh, system level end-to-end -end testing at Johnson. So this is the, uh, the, the center curvature, the optical test station at Tinsley. And so the mirror gets set on this mount. There's an interferometer here with a computer-generated hologram. Here's the you know, interferometer with the computer-generated hologram. And we took the same mirror and tested it on both tests. And, and um, this is just some more pretty pictures of what that looks like. So we tested one mirror on both test stations and we got uh, different answers. They were off by seven and a half, eight uh, nanometer, uh, you know, 370 nanometer air peak to valley. And it, it, as you look at it, it's mostly uh, a power and, and astigmatism. And so we, we analyzed the results and discovered that there was a, a backlash problem in one of the gears. And so we had to re replace that. And then we can get the, the two test stations now to agree to better than 10 nanometers. And that's the goal you've got to be able to get to better than 10 nanometers. And then here's the autocollimation test. So remember this test up here is the, the interferometer is the center of curvature. This test down here, the interferometer is at prime focus. And so it's, there's a flat mirror over here that we're testing. So this is an autocollimation test that gets us to confirmation on the radius of curvature, kind of constant, get the off axis distant and the clocking. And then we take the, the mirrors and we ship them to uh, Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado, where they were assembled together. Uh, this is called the Delta frame for obvious reasons. And then what you'll see is that there's this, this, these rods, it's called the strong back. These rods are connected to each corner of the mirror. So a mirror there, mirror there. And in the center of the mirror is an actuator. And that actuator basically, um, so if you, if, you, if you take your hand and you, you, you kind of cup your hand and move your fingers, what you're doing is that actuator is pushing on the palm and reacting against the tips of your fingers in order to change the radius of curvature of the mirror. So that we, uh, on orbit, we match the radius of curvature of the mirrors to each other with this mechanism. And the mirrors, when they were assembled, they were put into a test facility at Ball Aerospace. And now you'll see this is a center curvature test, but there's no fold mirror in it. So this is, this is a straight, and we test it. And then um, we got a comparison to Tensley. And the first time we tested it again, we're off by 200 nanometers peak to valley. All right. And, and the answer is, is simple, is that 
the test at Tinsley and the test at Ball Aerospace were at two different temperatures. And there was enough temperature difference inside the CT, the, ma the material of the beryllium, to cause this to be a power change. And so once we control the temperature, um, that eliminated, and now Tinsley and Ball are agreeing to each other to about 10 nanometers. And then we bring the entire mirror systems down to Huntsville, Alabama, and put it into this cryo vacuum chamber. This is uh, seven meters diameter, 23 meters uh, long. It was designed, anything that you can put inside the space shuttle can go inside of this chamber. And so anything that you could do, you could do a cryo back test, a vacuum test of a flight of a payload inside the space shuttle in this chamber. And um, we tested the mirrors down to 30 Kelvin in here. We tested them six at a time. Here's some pretty pictures. The backs of the mirrors. Um, and all of the actuators were live. And one of the things we did is we activated the mirrors and we moved them and we put them all the way to their extremes. Uh, we, we demonstrated that we could move the mirrors over their entire range of motion without changing the shape of the mirror by more than an acceptable amount, which was uh, predicted in the design and then air budgeted. Um, here's some more. Uh, we took the mirrors from room temperature down to 25 Kelvin, then brought them up to 45 Kelvin for testing, took them back, bring them back, go back. We're looking to make sure we don't have any hysteresis, make sure we get nice repeatable answers. And what you'll see is, is that different. there's different prescription mirrors. There's A prescription, B prescription, C prescription. Each mirror prescription has its own uh, a computer generated hologram to test the mirror. And we have one computer generated hologram for room temperature testing and another computer generated hologram for cryogenic testing because there is a change in the shape of the mirror. So we are verifying that the mirrors have the right shape at temperature. Uh, this picture was in, uh, um, uh, been a lot in the press. And so this is the mirror fabrication. These are all of the mirrors that were tested and, and uh, uh, then they were cryo, after they were cryo no polished to get into 20 nanometer air. And this, uh, this, this um, 20 some odd nanometer surface figure air is a composite air for the entire telescope. And, and uh, John Mather, who's the chief scientist said that if you were to take this telescope and lay it down on the continental US, that no bump on this telescope is bigger than the size of a grapefruit. Which is, which is a good analog. But if you think about it for the continental, so each one of these segments is about the size of Texas. So again, think about the boundary between Texas and New Mexico or Texas and, and, and Louisiana and having it so that those edges line up to each other to about the size of a grapefruit. That's the level of the technology that we're working on. And then we coated them all with a protective gold overcoat. And this picture, the, this red staircase is the specification for the coating. And then this is the reflectivity of each of the segments, uh, the witness samples from each of the segments. And then we take all the segments, all the segments went to Goddard where they were assembled. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the back plane structure here of the telescope. And this is just a bridge mechanism with robotic arm. And, and the mirror really is gold. You can see the gold, but there's a protective uh, co cover and then it gets picked up by the protective cover. It's moved into position, and then a human attaches it to the backplane structure. And then we do the shimming of the telescope and then do a potting of the shimming. And so this is what it sort of looks like when it's all put together. And then we took it down to Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and we put it inside this chamber. This, this is the uh, chamber A at Johnson. It's 37 meters tall, 20 meter diameter with a 12 meter size door. This is a forklift here. You can see how big this door is. And um, what we're doing is we're actually hanging the telescope on a trapeze. So we have a bunch of vibration isolation mechanisms uh, we uh, mounted to the top of the chamber with cabling coming through. So we're basically hanging this te entire telescope on a trapeze swing. And here you can see the picture. So again, we're we're putting the we're putting the telescope into the chamber. It just barely clears the door. You know, again, scale. There's some people, and you can see, you know, all of these cables that we're hanging it on, in order to test it. And then after it, and I think it was tested there from July 17 to November 20, uh, 18. And there was a hurricane that went through Houston at the time, and they tested right straight through the hurricane. 
and then it gets put into a shipping container and uh, shipped out to, to uh, Northrop Grumman to be integrated with the spacecraft and the sunshades. There's a picture of the spacecraft there. So this is the clean room out in Northrop Grumman. There's the, uh, the telescope all folded up. It, it, it's on, this is its carry case. They can rotate it, it can rotate it, it can flip it. This is the spacecraft over here with the sunshade. And so now we drop the telescope onto the spacecraft, made it together. And then one of the things they did is we, uh, we tested everything. Uh, we, we deployed the telescope wings and then several times we opened up and folded back up and opened up and folded back up the uh, sunshade. Uh, the sunshade was probably the most risky element is that I've heard it said there was 300 um, uh, uh, non-redundant uh, mechanisms on the sunshade that couldn't, uh, um, there was no backup. And then it was all taken, buttoned up and taken out to Vibrant Acoustic. And then after that, it was put back into a shipping container, loaded onto uh, this specialized uh, boat, taken uh, over through the, uh, the Panama Canal into French Guiana. Here's, here's the boat arriving um, from, from fr at French Guiana, the launch site in the Amazon River or whatever, yeah, no, not the, whatever that river is, not the Amazon, it's down here. But anyway, and then it's offloading. And then here's the rocket being put into the assembly and integration uh, tower. They brought the telescope in, they lifted up this hole, uh, drops the telescope down onto the rocket. It gets mated with the, uh, the rocket fairing, uh, or with the rocket, the fairing gets put on. The whole thing gets put onto a, uh, a, a railroad track and uh, taken out to the launch site. And it launched and it was beautiful. <laughs> and there's the last picture uh, of it uh, being released uh, off of the, uh, the spacecraft. And it's going out to the Sun Earth L2 point. So this red circle uh, is where Hubble is in low Earth orbit. Here's the moon. And then we're going out to L2. And the reason we go to L2, there's many reasons. One is it's gravitationally stable. So this here, as you can see, it's at a saddle of gravity. So it's gravitationally stable. And it's not orbiting the Earth. It's orbiting the sun uh, it, along with the Earth. So it's, it's tracking outside of the Earth and orbiting the, the sun as it goes around. So it's the, the, uh, the gravitational pull of the sun and the Earth together is balancing the centripetal uh, force that we're wants to take the, uh, the the telescope out of the of of the orbit, and also it's not a specific location in space. It's it's a huge area. You know this orbit, this orbit ellipse is that you know it's it's one and a half million kilometers out. This orbit is one and a half million kilometers. It's it's a gigantic. So you can see the volume of the orbit right here is illustrated. There's, in addition to being gravitationally stable, it's very thermally stable. It's a very nice thermal stable orbit. Um, the other, other advantage is that uh, in low Earth orbit, Hubble, it can only take data when it's in the shade, you know, the sun, the, in, in the night side of the Earth's orbit. So it only takes data about half the time, not even half time. Uh, out at Sun Earth L2, we, the, the web can take data uh, almost continuously, 80, 85% efficient. And so it, uh, a single year of web data is equal to about um, uh, five years of Hubble data. So, so, and that's because of not only the efficiency of web, but also because of the fact that again, web is 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 got a larger collecting area. It's, it's got higher sensitivity. So we launched web in uh, 1990. So it's coming on. It, it, it will go in say 2030s. You know, it's going to be a 40-year mission. And so uh, with that 40 years, but with web, if we're expecting web to go 20 years, it's it's going to get approximately 100 years of Hubble data. So it's going to produce much more data than the Hubble telescope. And, and um, I know I had a question about the cost. The life cycle cost of Webb with all of its serv of, of Hubble, with all of its service emissions has been about $20 billion. So far, the life cycle cost of, of uh, Webb is uh, less than $10 billion. And with the um, first level of uh, science, it'll be about 10 billion. And then there'll probably be a few billion more uh, for follow on years. 
but uh, the amount of science that we're getting, the bang for the buck, the return on investment on web is going to be much, much higher than the return on investment was for web. Another question is, you know, downlink. One, uh, another advantage of being out here at Sun Earth L2 is we have pretty much a direct shot back to the earth. So it's very easy to get the data back down to the earth and we only need one ground station. Uh, whereas like uh, uh, things that are in low earth orbit need multiple ground stations in order to do the downlink. Uh, the other question was uh, that got a, a serviceability. Um, Sun Earth L2 is not a good place for humans. It has got a reasonable amount of radiation, um, but the Congress mandates that any mission that we do has some serviceability. So we have um, a, a, a trailer hook, if essentially on built into web, is that if at some point this planet develops a technology of a, a, a space tow truck, to go out and grab a hold of web and drag it back. Uh, we, we've given them a place to grab a hold so they can drag it back. But other than that, uh, there's no real um, design for serviceability. But future missions we're looking at with more issues with design for serviceability. So here's a movie. Um, so it launches, it separates. That looks like the picture that you saw. We deploy the uh, the, the sunshade, the solar panels, because we got to get electricity to the batteries. The next thing we're going to do is we have to get the uh, uh, the communication. Uh, we didn't have to do that, so we have to get the communication out so we can establish communication. And then one over the last couple of weeks, we've opened up the sunshade. So this is the animation on how we're opening up the sunshade. It deploys down. And then there's these two trays that everything is in. We have to push the telescope up to get it away from the sunshade. This is a kite tail. And we use that for flying the, uh, the telescope on the solar wind. And, and it functions just like a kite tail. And it helps with momentum offloading. And then we have two uh, um, uh, beam, uh, booms that we have to push out. We pull the sunshade out. And then we spread everything out and separate it. And we have to get these, uh, all of these sunshades have to get spread out and tensioned in order for the cooling to work. And this is like day 11, and we have to deploy the secondary. Once you have a secondary tower deployed, you actually have a telescope. The wings don't have to bring out, even though the wings do come out, because you still had the center of the telescope. And that's where we're at right about now. And now the next thing we have to do is over the next course of the next month, is we're going to bring each of the mirror segments off of their uh, launch numbers and put them into place. And uh, we will, the, the, uh, the, the um, deploying team will start to see, uh, we hope to see 18, there's 18 segments. We hope to see 18 uh, points of light onto the detector sometime in March. And then what we'll slowly do is we'll start uh, bent, uh, tipping and tilting all the segments to bring all those uh, individual images together, stack them on top of each other. And then what we have to do is we have to go through the process of phasing the segments to get them to line up to each other to better than 10 nanometers. Um, and, and then once we have that done, then we'll have a telescope and we can start doing some preliminary science. So, um, Science theme number one, again, is the first light. We've talked about the reionization of the universe. And one of the things is that, you know, how do galaxies form? Is that it, there's, there's rivers of dark matter in, in the universe and where these rivers interact with each other, these filaments is where the galaxies form. And so this is uh, some, some, some help of some data that shows, you know, some filaments overlapping and, and the galaxies forming and where those filaments overlap. And then, you know, the Hubble Deep Field is a very famous image. And so this is uh, uh, the Hubble Deep Field taken. And uh, inside this deep field, there are 47 galaxies that are all somewhere in this, you know, less than a billion years after the, uh, the Big Bang. And then we look at that same field in Chandra, and every one of those galaxies has got a black hole in it. And so one of the questions is, what came first, the black hole or the galaxy? And to, to me, um, you know, one of the things that I have a thought was, is that maybe these black holes were left over from the expansion after the Big Bang. Maybe these black holes are actually pieces of the, uh, of the Big Bang that never fully expanded. And, and, uh, and so that's one thing, one idea. And these are called actually primordial black holes. So that's one of the things to look at. 
and uh, they're very highly energetic. But there is another theory is that, remember I said that those first stars were like a thousand times bigger than our own sun? They're absolutely huge. It could be that those first stars, instead of going, you know, if they got too big, instead of going supernova, they may have actually done a direct collapse into a black hole. And so here's actually uh, some Hubble data. You know, here's a star right here, and it's only 25 times the size of our star, our sun. And, and it completely disappeared without going supernova. It just turned into a black hole directly. And then when we talk about Spitzer, again, Spitzer is an infrared telescope. This is the same region uh, that you saw with Hubble. And with Spitzer, you're just seeing so much more. It's because in the infrared, you can see further back. And the other thing is each one of those red circles is an early galaxy that's extremely bright in that you know it's producing a lot of radiation and we don't necessarily know why but it's like it's got must have a lot of mass and is producing a lot of star formation so then assembly of galaxies is that you know uh, carl sagan and and where did the heavy elements come from uh carl sagan said we're all stardust all the heavy elements formed out of uh supernovae so those first stars first generation stars are pure hydrogen they explode, the next generation of stars have some helium, and then each succeeding generation of stars has got things like carbon and other heavy elements. And so one of the things we look at is uh, the generation of what's the makeup of the stars. So again, some spectroscopy. And then, so this is some Subaru data of this, of a deep field, uh, and there's uh, 22 uh, ancient supernovae. So 10% of, of the Subaru deep field is made up of just things going supernovae. So we're expecting with Webb, when we look at you know far, far away, we're going to see lots of things blowing up. The other thing is uh, the galaxies is that the very oldest galaxies are very simple and they're also pretty blue. And they're pretty blue because they're making a lot of stars. They also have a lot of gas, which is how you make stars. And, and as they come into closer and closer in time, they run into each other, they evolve, they turn into spiral and, and, and he, you know, so this, the, the Hubble, you know, um, sequence, you know, spirals, ellipticals, how do these things form? And, and one of the things, so again, this is some uh, infrared Spitzer data of galaxies running into each other. And so here's some examples of galaxies running into each other. Here's some Hubble data of galaxies running into each other. And this is again in the optical and the infrared. And this is actually uh, uh, two galaxies with the merging with each other with Chandra data. So this is uh, Hubble data here, and this is the Chandra data. So in the Chandra, you can see there are two black holes that are orbiting each other as, as this galaxy merges together. But the other thing is you'll notice when we look at this in the infrared, there's not a lot of heat. So these galaxies, when they merge, there's not a lot of things running into each other because galaxies are mostly empty space and the gravity kind of keeps you from bumping into things. Then the science theme planetary systems, you know, how do planetary systems form? And there's different argument, there's different theories about whether it's uh, accre accretion or uh, embedded protostites and, and also star formation. So you've seen this one already with the star formation in the, in the but this is the whole Spitzer. So that region of the star formation was right there. And this is what the Spitzer, remember I showed you, Spitzer has three times the field of view of Hubble. So this is what the full Spitzer image was looking like. And what we're seeing is, is that each one of these green boxes is a young star that was formed. And over here on the right hand is the youngest stars. And what's happening is, is that these older stars over here is producing solar wind that's compressing the dust cloud is supersonically compressing the dust out, which acceler uh, heats it up, which is what causes the stars to form. And so here's an example of this is a shock wave of this star uh, blowing through a dust cloud at 24 uh, kilometers per second. And so here's some examples of uh, clouds of, of the uh, stars that are formed that Herschel saw in the infrared inside the Eagle Nebula of this is you know, the star here and star here, and they're clearing out bubbles inside the, the nebulae. And here, I just like this picture. Um, and, and the important thing is that Hubble is that Herschel had spectroscopy and each one of these colors represents a different gas, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon. And so you can see all the building blocks of life are out there. Here's an example again, 
this is a star here that formed. It's blowing out. What it's doing is force feeding a star down here with the shock wave. And that, sh that star is going to is be just way too big, you know, 100, 150 times our sun, and it'll blow up eventually. Um, and here's some, some pictures, Hubble pictures of the Orion Nebulae. Each one of these frames is a planetary system. You can see the sun, you can see its star, you can see the, 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 circum, the circumstellar disk clearing out the debris disk. And, and, and uh, this is also a like Herschel, is they did the spectroscopy and look at, you know, there's methane and water and carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide. So again, formaldehyde, all of the building blocks for organic, for organic uh, chemistry. So finally, uh, planetary systems origin of life. There's two theories, the accretion model, gas collapse model. So I think that the uh, new horizon leans towards the accretion theory. So here is an image from the of, of Ultima uh, tool with the new horizon. And from the spectroscopy, you can see all of the various bits and pieces of things that slam together in order to create this object. You know, it's it's not at all homogenous. It's it's a it's a it's an accretion of lots of smaller things that uh, got bumped together. And so, what do we know about the uh, our our own solar system? You know, we have planets, but then over time, we discover there's more and more and more asteroids and minor planets. And some of these minor planets are bigger than Pluto. And so, what do we know is that you know planetary systems have dust. So if you want to study planetary systems, you got to look at the dust. So here's some images out of Alma of different dust clouds. You can see the rings, the planetary systems. There's planets there that are, that are sweeping out the dust. These things are turning into spiral systems. And here, these are all planetary systems. And here's an example of, uh, of an image with an Alma. And, uh, and then this is our planetary system. So you can see this planetary system and its rings are not all that different from our own planetary system and, and orbits of our planets. And, and this, is, this, this is another Alma image. And you can see this is the size of one AU here, the circle, which would be the orbit of the Earth. So an Earth's orbit would fit inside here. And again, what do we see is we see a region of, of dust somewhere outside of the Earth's orbit, uh, not unlike our own. Um, but one of the things so we look at with habitable zones is uh, we got to look for uh, liquid water. It, we sometimes call this the Goldilocks zone. Is that you want to? We we want to find planets that exist in the zone of liquid water uh, or the habitable zone. And where does the water come from? Well, stars make water. Is that stars basically are spewing water out of their north and south poles, shooting water out jets, just like in you know with the uh, black holes have got jets of matter. Anything that's spinning and rotating is got stuff. Uh, going out the, the, the along the rotation axis. Well, with the, the Spitzer telescope, they did spectroscopy. And what they found is, is that stars are shooting water out of their poles and they go up and then they, they collect onto the dust and then they fall back down onto the planetary disk as snow. And so that's how you grow planetary disks. And that snow doesn't necessarily have to be water. That snow can be methane. That snow can be carbon dioxide. And, and the, the snow lines of, of, of vary from each of these things. So there's a snow line here at a certain distance from the star for water. There's another. And so here's like the, the 150K snow line. You know, there's snow lines for methane. And, and, and where you st get stuff, there's, um, you know, and there's a whole study about how these things go. And the, the role of the impact of, say, Jupiter is that, you know, you ever think, of why do we have so much iron? You know, iron, you'd think would want to gravitate close into the sun. Well, one of the reasons that our planet has so much iron is because we have Jupiter, is that Jupiter's gravity pulled enough iron away from the sun to give us an iron core. And, and so those are the kinds of things. So when you look at it, you, you want to have, in order to study planetary systems, you have to have different wavelengths. And so the Webb telescope is going to cover this uh, region here of the, the, the particles and the dust lines of the planetary system. Whereas a far infrared, we need to go out and look at the Kuiper belt and a visible telescope with the chronograph will look in closer. Exoplanets, we 
first exoplanet we found 1995. Um, this data charts old, just I've, I've, I can't keep up anymore, but we literally have thousands of, of potential planets that we found from radial velocity, from Kepler, from we're finding planets now from TESS. And, and so one of the things is, you know, how do we detect exoplanets? Here's the radial velocity method. As the planet orbits the star, the uh, starlight gets shifted with the Doppler effect. So by looking at red shifting and blue shifting of the light from the sun, that star, we can detect a planet that's moving. The bigger the planet, the bigger the radial shift. And that's how we found uh, uh, the early planets. And then we, and Spitzer also did some radial velocity. Then there's the transit method, which is what we're doing right now with TESS, where we look at a, plan, a planetary system at a John. And when, and this is also what we did with Kepler, is that when, when a planet blocks a little bit of sunlight, it dips that, that light curve. And that dip is only a fraction of a percent. And so depending, the bigger the planet, obviously the bigger the dip and number of dips that you see. So this is the way we do with Kepler. And we're doing the same thing with TESS, except instead of looking at light curves, we're looking at the uh, spectroscopy of the planet. We're looking at the, we're getting spectral information. And so here's some examples, some light curves on Keck and Kepler is over a thousand, you know, 4,000 potential planets. And uh, one of the famous ones, Kepler, this is Kepler-22. And again, here is the, the Kepler-22 planetary system. Here's our own solar system. Um, another very famous one is Trappist, although Trappist was originally thing, I think, found by Spitzer, um, but then it was confirmed. So again, here's our planetary system. Here's the Trappist planetary system. And you can see that the sizes of, of the Trappist planets are similar to our own. The only problem with the Trappist is it's an M-class star. We're a G-class star. The problem with M-class stars is that they have a lot of solar flares and they pop off you know, huge radiation clouds every so often. And, and effectively, anything that's, you know, they, they're basically sterilizing these early, these planets in here. And, and they may even be sterilizing these plants out here, but M-class stars are, are, there's lots and lots and lots of them in the universe, but they're also a radiation. And this is how uh, Spitzer observed the Trappist. And so here's the data down here. And so what you do is you get enough data and you get enough repeats on the data. And then you do just a Fourier transfer and decomposition in order to pull out the uh, periodicity from the data. Um, one of the things I've been, so I signed off that the Webb telescope mirrors met the requirements in 2011. This is what I've been working on since is how do we go and see exoplanets? So one way is to block the sunlight with direct imaging. And uh, uh, so one of the things is that there's this inner working angle we can't see and we have to, so and anything that has this back to us is too faint. So we can only see planets that are here and here. So we have to look at it and then we have to look at it again. We have to wait for it to rotate. We look at it again. And, and so we have to build up. And so this is some Hubble data of, um, this is 20 AU bar down here. And so you can see there's a planet there, planet there, planet there, planet there. And uh, these are all, these are about seven times, uh, this one's about uh, seven times the mass of Jupiter and it's mostly made up of methane and carbon monoxide. And so this is the kind of stuff we've seen. What we are really wanting to see is we want something over here in this green dot. So with the radial velocity things, we see big things in close to the star, which is hot Jupiter um, and, and these lava worlds. And so we, this is the goal over here to try and find. And so far inside of Kepler is that we found maybe a hundred exoplanets in the habitable zone, maybe 25 of which are within two Earth radius. And, um, but then it's more than just finding it in the habitable zone. You also have to figure out how close are they to, the sun, to their sun. So if you have, say our sun is about 5,500 uh, uh, Kelvin sun. And so we have to think is that we want to be in this blue box right here where we have enough sunlight, but not too, uh, not too much. And if you go too far out, then you're like Mars. And so there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, rules, if you will, of where you can not only have liquid water, but you also have the right chemistry. And you want to avoid carbon dioxide toxicity in, in, in terms of if you accumulate. So if you're too hot, then it doesn't work. The other thing we're finding is, is that there is um, populations. 
is that in the population, there's things that are like one earth size, one and a half earth size, two and a half earth size. And, and again, it has to do with there's a harmonics. There's the harmonics of the spheres as these things uh, circulate around their stars. And, and the orbits are all harmonics of each other. I, I took that chart out, but the orbits are all harmonics of each other. So if our galaxy has about 100 billion stars, of which 17 billion are G-class stars, that mean, and if every single, and, and we're finding that every single star, no matter its size, has got planets. And, and on average, every single star has an Earth-sized planet. There could be 17 billion Earth-sized planets just in our um, uh, galaxy alone. The question is how many of those are in the habitable zone? The other thing I will assert is that you have to have a moon like our moon in order to have uh, the life that we have on our planet is that without our moon, life would not have evolved on this planet. And it has to do with the tides in pulling, um, you know, the tidal pools and life and, and, and aquatic life being exposed to oxygen. It also has to do with the fact that the moon acts like an outrigger that stabilizes the spin axis of our planet. When our uh, spin axis rotated just by about three to five degrees, the entire Saharan res, uh, region of Africa went from a lush tropical forest to a, uh, a desert. And so if it, the, uh, the moon is what keeps our spin axis stable, which gives us the, billion, you know, the billions of years and millions, hundreds of millions of years needed uh, to evolve life on this planet. And in order to have life, you know, what does it take? You have to have a liquid core so that you can have a magnetic field so that we can protect our atmosphere from solar winds. Mars doesn't have that. Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. Mars doesn't have enough mass to hold its atmosphere. And Mars doesn't have a magnetic field to keep its atmosphere from getting blown away. And of course, and I said, you have to have an atmosphere and you have to have a surface is that, you know, unless we're going to be a water planet and you know, if in order for us to be here, we had to have a surface that we could, you know, that our, we could crawl out of the ocean and onto the onto the land. And so, how do we go look for life? You know, do we look for little green men? Do we look for radio waves? Do we look for I Love Lucy reruns. Um, you know, do we look for uh, laser beacons? Um, well, you know, Sarah Seeger's got the argument. No. What you do is you look for what it is that life does. And what life does is it metabolizes. It eats and it poops. And so what we have to do is we want to look for the byproducts, the, bio, the, the byproducts of biology. On our planet, every single chemical reaction that turns one thing into another that produces energy for a living organism has these byproducts, ammonia, methane, uh, uh, water, uh, carbon dioxide, um, things like that. So those are the things we want to look at. So we want to do spectroscopy on exoplanets, the atmospheres of exoplanets, to look for those markers of biology, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone. Um, maybe if you could see a red edge of, you know, a, a smoking gun for, a methane would be a smoking gun, but methane is really, really hard to find. Or if you could see um, uh, other things to look for is uh, uh, so when we look at a planet, if it's if it's got clouds, that's a good thing. If it looks like Venus, it's probably not habitable. You know, Venus is just a blue haze. So we don't want to look for planets that have blue haze. We want to look for planets that have a very. So this is how you get spectroscopy: is that we can get spectroscopy as the planet passes between us and its sun. And and uh, we this is what uh, uh, Tess is doing: it's looking at detecting of exoplanets. And the other thing is, is that the spectroscopy of, of, of life uh, on our planet changes. So our early, early planet, we didn't have any oxygen. It wasn't until blue and green algae came along that we started to get oxygen. So that the, the spectra of our planet would be different depending upon when you look at it. And so the spectra of another planet might be different depending upon when we look at it. So we want to be able to get all the spectra. Also, there are geological ways in which you can get uh, spectra that have oxygen and carbon dioxide that are not produced by biology. So we have to be careful about that. And then I was talking about this, clouds. Uh, if you see variations in the photometry of the planet, that could be clouds, that could be continents. Uh, polarization, water polarizes light. 
if there's polarization in the light reflected off the planet, then that planet probably has water on it. So those are the things that we want to look at. And so this is the, the, the National Academy of Science, NASA every 10 years asks the National Academy of Science, what should we do next? And, and the National Academy, it's called the Decadal Report. And the Decadal Report for 2020 it was just released in November of 2021. And it said that the next big mission that, the, that NASA should do is it should build a, a large telescope to go try and get spectra of about 25 Earth-like planets around an Earth-like sun somewhere else in, 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 our, in our local neighborhood. And uh, I worked on, on this mission, which is called the Habitable Exoplanet Mission. And then there was also this large UV optical mission. And we're basically uh, looking at how do we merge these two concepts together in order to make the next big mission. Um, and so this is how you do coronography, is that the light comes in to the telescope. We focus down, so this is the sunlight. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put a disk in and it's called a chronographic mask. We block the sunlight. And then what we do is we put this is a Leo stop that just cleans up things. So this is what now the, the, the image of the sun looks like. And then the starlight, come, the, the Earth, the planet light comes in. It passes around the mask and onto the detector. And then we have to use a deformable mirror in order to correct the wavefront. And what this is doing is this is pulling in and making the sun's image really, really, really compact so that it gets better and better blocked by that chronographic mask. And then as it, we're digging what's called the dark hole. So we're digging the dark hole. And as you dig the dark hole, then you can find the planet. And in fact, there's another planet. And then there's another way to do it. And that's with something called a star shade. And, and you've all done this, is that if you've ever held your hand up to the sun in order to see something to block the sun, that's exactly what the sun, star shade does. So this is like a 40, 50 meter diameter device that we fly out uh, 10,000, 10, 20,000 kilometers away from the telescope. And it's going to block the starlight, uh, the light from the, the planetary system sun, and then allow you to see the, uh, the planets that are in orbit around this, that particular star. And so that's the other concept of starshade. And then here's some examples of simulated imagery. So coming back to Hubble, or to Webb, excuse me. So Webb is going to be six times larger collecting area, more sensitivity than Hubble. It's going to see further back in time than, than Hubble. It's going to see the first luminous objects of the, of the universe, the first stars, maybe the first black holes, the first galaxies. Um, here's where we're at right now. We've just finished deploying we're start, uh, the structure, and now we have to start deploying the primary mirror. And then we go into cool down mode, and then there, we have to align all of the, the, the mirrors to each other, the images of the 18 telescope mirrors, align everything into the instruments. And the first science image of commissioning is somewhere about six months out from launch. So somewhere in June, uh, we expect to see the first science and then we go into the early release. There's two kinds of science. There's uh, early release science that once it's taken, it'll be released right away. And then each of the science instruments has a principal investigator. The principal investigator for that instrument has exclusive use of the data that they uh, have signed up for. So there's exclusive use data that they have, but they have to publish something within so many days, you know, weeks. You know, like I think they have like three months or six months that they have to make a publishment and then, then their data becomes available to anyone. Uh, NASA maintains data archives. Well, actually, Space Telescope Institute maintains data archives and anybody can go and mine those data. Here's the most recent date of uh, January 10th of the temperature of the telescope. So that you can already see the mirrors are starting to cool down. You know, the mirrors further out are, you know, 70 Kelvin. A liquid nitrogen, some of the mirrors in, you know, in closer around 90 Kelvin. And uh, this is the back plane structure temperature. So we're monitoring the temperature of the mirrors as it goes. And uh, there's, um, I'll leave this up there. There's a, uh, the, the web telescope has a, has a blog. So you can log into the blog channel. And there's also a website. And all of these pretty pictures are just a small fraction of the pretty pictures that are available on the website. Uh, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Stahl. Uh, do you want to turn off the uh, share so we can well, maybe ask a few questions? 
There you go. That was fabulous. Uh, one of the uh, comments was we were, we got about a hundred episodes of Nova in one hour, <laughs> and almost so, as many questions to ask. Yes. So I've I've actually met Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, several times, and um, I had a I had a, a, a planetary tide that uh, he was admiring, and so in one of our meetings in Boulder, Colorado, I, I gave him my tie, and he gave me twenty bucks, but he wore it on the Today Show. Uh, the the two days later he was he was alive in person in the Today Show talking about um, all the, um, the 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 probe to, to uh, Jupiter's uh, moon Titan a uh, uh, Cassini talking about the Cassini probe and the uh, the commentator asked him a question about the cost of Cassini and he said that the cost of Cassini amortized over the entire uh, American uh, population was equal to a, a stick of lipstick per person. <laughs> Very good. Rod, do you want to take the first questions? Well, so we've got the list that was presented before, and then we've got uh, 11 or 12 that just came in, which you want to do first. And, and I tried to cover most of those questions on the list. Okay. Then, then yeah. let's take Hope, a couple of new ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from Heath Hoffner, was it at all expected that the JWST might not use as much fuel as it did so we can have a longer lifespan? I think you addressed that. Um, in, in all of the lectures, so I've been giving this lecture all around the world for the last 15 years. I've always said that we were flying enough fuel for 15 years. Um, I was surprised to hear them say 20. Okay. Uh, from Bill Gardner, how do you distinguish the intrinsic redshift, oh, good Lord, in Herbig Haro objects from cosmological redshift? That's a little technical. I'm not an astronomer, I'm an optics technologist. Very good, excellent answer. <laughs> I, um, and I, and, 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 oh, I should say, I, I used to have the line where I say, I'm not an astronomer and I don't play one on TV. But nobody um, remembers but, that now, right? But but as my audiences became younger, that joke didn't land and you can't right. use that joke in, internationally because no one no one ever remembers, You know, they never saw that commercial. They just stare <laughs> at you. Uh, Matthew Levine says, regarding the radiation levels at L2, why is it benign? Is it protected by Earth's magneto tail? Uh, a little bit, but um, it, it's not totally 100% benign, but it's not as nasty as low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit has got the uh, South Atlantic anomaly. And so every time a, a, a mission goes through the low Earth orbit, it, hits, it gets a, a really big hit of radiation. So uh, that's that's really the, the, the it's really a comparison to the low Earth orbit. Um, the L two is really no different than geo, and 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 I think you all know that you know geo the 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 com industry uh, when they first set up they expected all their geo birds to you know burn out after a short period of time and they've lasted forever and ever, and and um, so it's the same thing we're finding that things out at L two are lasting much longer. Um, we basically have to shut them off eventually. So Frank Eccles asked, uh, what about other objects trapped at L2? Are those a hazard? Uh, because it's a gravitationally unstable place, it's a uh, gravitational saddle, it doesn't accumulate uh, much debris. So we have to actively keep the telescope at that location with the propellant. And that once we run out of propellant, the telescope will either slowly drift and fall into the sun or slowly drift and go out into deep space. But uh, you have to work to keep things there. But it's only a few right. kilograms of power per year, uh, propellant uh, per year to keep it there. I feel like we're in a lightning round of questions here. This is perfect. Um, Jim Wilrich asks, when will we start seeing first images? Uh, six months. June. Okay. I mean, what our, the, 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 the commissioning team will start seeing stuff in March. I will get an indication sometime end of March of, of how well it's working. Okay, uh, Donna Glass was asking, uh, will the images we see from the web be similar in, in, in beauty and context to what we saw with Hubble? Yeah, so um, that one comparison chart you saw that at uh, one point something microns, the, uh, the Hubble point spread function is like uh, 0.1, is, you know, 0 0.14 arc, sec, um, uh, arc seconds and the web is uh, 0.06 arc seconds. So web's uh, point spread function at the same image is going to be smaller. Um, 
So it's it's going to be exquisite. But I think the question was kind of oriented towards aesthetics. Oh, well, that's... You know, the Hubbles are colorful and saturated and beautiful. What are we going to see from Webb? Well, I think, remember remember the uh, the uh, Herschel picture I showed you with all the different colors of the different uh, uh, molecules in... And and I find that that to be a very pretty picture. And Herschel is a uh, a seventy micron to one hundred fifty micron. It's a much longer wavelength. Um, you know, it, the artists that make these things can will will make them pretty. Right. Uh, Bill Gardner asked if you know what percentage of exoplanet systems are edge on to us, and I think that's with regard to the transit. Yeah, I I don't know. I haven't been tracking tests closely enough, but um, I think there's a reasonable number. I th I think in that regard, the, um, the 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 universe is kind to us, and it's sort of is because we're in a good orientation. I, I mean, I mean, so if you think about it, our solar system is 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 orbiting our black hole as part of an arm. But it's also it's also not flat. It's just, so I think most every solar system that's orbiting is is probably got the same the same gravitational dynamics. Now here may be the most important question of all from Raymond Merrick. Is that a JWST lapel pin you're wearing? And if so, how can I get one? <laughs> uh, Lee Feinberg gave me this one. Lee Feinberg was the. Uh, uh, the telescope uh, uh, manager. So I was the lead. Um, I was the optics lead. My job was, I actually signed off that the mirrors met the requirements in 2011 and started working on the next one in 2011. And, and Lee was left behind to, to manage the schedule and, and all that. And he gave me this in, in December. Um, but you can buy, um, I got a pair of web socks for Christmas and I got a, a, a web a web lapel of a uh, brooch, uh, which is about twice the size of this one. So they're available uh, online. And I noticed someone acknowledged that I was from Ohio. I don't know how they knew from I was I was from Ohio. Um, but I saw something pop up on my screen that said, hello from an Ohio one. Yeah, possibly uh, LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, I did. I said my family, my, my mom, the family farm down the road. Right. Yes. There you go. So if you're from Ohio, I grew up in Bellevue, Ohio which is about seven miles away from Plumbrook, uh, which is outside of Sandusky. Uh, and, and most people maybe have heard of Cedar Point. So you, you talked about the actuators on the back of the mirrors. Are the individual cells actually deformable or just aimable? Uh, so there is a hexapod behind each mirror that we can, um, we can push it up, we can tip it and tilt it, we can slide it in plane up and down. We can roll, rotate it in plane. And of course, then we can change the radius of curvature. And it's all done with the hexapod. Okay. And you talked a little bit about the next generation, which is, I'm always afraid I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Louvoir. And is that right? Yeah. Next. So so the Louvoir was large UV optical, and then HabX was habitable exoplanet. And the decadal, in order to not pick favorites, recommended a large infrared optical UV. And, and we're calling it uh, um, uh, Virgo, uh, visible op V U I R G O, visible ultraviolet infrared great observatory. So the decadal has recommended a series of three over the next 20 or 30 years, great new great observatories. Uh, you could say great observatories for the 21st century of optical, far infrared and x-ray. And, and last I saw, at, at least uh, the Louvre would be roughly twice the diameter of, of Webb, is that right? Uh, the recommendation out of the decadal is something roughly about six meters. So it'd be about the same size as Webb. Okay, okay. Uh, Bert, how are we doing on time? Uh, let's see. We've got about another five minutes or so. And I can go as long as you guys oh, okay. as you have questions. Oh, boy. You know, this, I said, this is my job. My job, you know, I'm, I'm a NASA civil servant, and my job is to uh, represent the agency to, you know, and you, you guys paid for this, so get your money's <laughs> worth. Okay. And I, I, I have one question for you, uh, more about uh, maybe what we've learned in terms of the design. Obviously, 
it took a longer to design than we initially anticipated. And you mentioned the, the cost. Uh, what have we learned from this entire process that will help us make it easier the next time we do a space telescope? Uh, that's a really complicated question. Oh, okay. and, 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 and <laughs> Leave it to Bernard. You'll get, you'll get different answers depending upon who you ask. Um, you know, some people will think that we tried to build something too big and too expensive. Some people will think that, you know, I, I think one of the lessons is that at the start of Webb, it was said that there are 10 miracles that have to occur, that we have to invent 10 new technologies to, to make this happen. And so one of the things that we did on the, Hab, on the HabX study is we constrained ourselves to three miracles. Um, and, right. and I think that's, that's a general nice rule of thumb is that um, the other it, it limit the number of new things that you got to invent. The other thing is one of the things that the Decadal did that I really strongly endorse is Decadal said, okay, we're recommending this next mission. And this is what we're recommending you go look at like a six meter class something. But at the same time, it cannot cost more than 11 billion. And all of your technology has to get to TRL level six before you can start going into phase A. And, and I think that's just really, really smart is that because you want to get all your technology as mature as possible um, in, in order to buy down the risk. The other thing is that the decadal said, a lesson learned from Webb, is you cannot start the mission unless you can show that you can pay for the mission uh, in a real um, uh, time frame. One of the biggest problems we had with Webb is that we were incurring uh, uh, risks, and in order to buy down the risk, we needed to spend money, but we didn't have the spend. We didn't have the money to spend. Uh, the, the 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 spending the funding profile for Webb uh, that was available didn't match with the funding profile that we needed to do the mission, and so a lot of work got de deferred. A lot of work on the Sunshade got deferred. A lot of work on the spacecraft got deferred, and and work deferred is is a, just a bow wave of you know. There's a multiplier effect. And so, you know, I would say that a billion dollars of the cost overrun on web was because we didn't have um, enough money <laughs> early enough on the program. Hmm. That's a typical problem when we try things sometimes, isn't it? We, we don't, uh, you're trying to invent something and you think, oh, we can, we can budget something in, in invention. And you sometimes yeah. you can't do that, right? <laughs> I have another uh downstream forward looking question, I guess, once Starship is flying commercially, assuming it, it does, uh, how do you see that kind of cargo capacity changing design and mission intention of large space telescopes? So there's actually two or three different parts to this question. Um, I am a huge proponent of the SLS. And, and I'm a little uh, less, cons uh, the, um, the commercial vehicle guys. So here, here's the deal. It's, it's all about volume. It's all about the fairing size. A five meter fairing on a commercial rocket doesn't do me any good. As I, I can go buy a, you know, I can go buy a, an Atlas V or a, a Vulcan or whatever, you know, this new rocket is. It, I need, in order to go to the next generation, I need an eight or 10 meter fairing. And, and, and I also need that fairing to be 20, you know, 30 huh. meters tall. And so if the commercial guys are going to give me that big fairing, I, I'm all in favor. But, you know, right now the SLS is the only thing that I can see. And the National Academy did an entire study back when the SLS was called Constellation. They did an entire study on science that you could do with a big rocket called the Constellation. You know, and and that was when it was called the uh, the Aries, the Aries one and the Aries five, um, and and there's math. So in the big rocket has a couple of different advantages. Um, you guys are, are are space and planetary. So what can you do if you could put um, a a couple of kilogram payload into uh, a, a, a launch a couple of kilogram a couple of hundred you know a couple a couple of thousand kilogram payload with a with a C3, a three or four, is that now what you can do is you can put 
a Landsat class satellite into orbit around Jupiter or Saturn, and you can get it there in a couple of years instead of a couple of tens of years. Um, and so it's not it's not necessarily uh, the big rocket is more than just mass. It's the C3, it's the mass, but it's for me and big telescopes, it's all about the volume. A couple a couple quick questions. I know we're we're pushing the the time limit, but uh, that were submitted. Uh, I saw there was one question about how do we talk to students and maybe non the non sciences to uh, scientists to explain the value of something like this to our society. That's a really tough question, and. Um, You know, I've given I've given this lecture, like I said, all around the world: China, Russia, India, Australia, Japan. Um, and the thing that the audience really gloms onto is the the exoplanets and the the search for life, um, and and that is what really captures the imagination of of the people. Um, and and again, I'm not an astronomer, but I have an astronomy friend. And and um, you know he he had he has this this little riff about he argues that astronomy is really really important because it helps to for humans to put their place into the uh, the universe and that when astronomers uh, convinced human society that we were no longer the center of the universe it, it changed everybody's perspective is that the universe did not revolve around us, although maybe some people think it still does. Um, and, and so the, the real question is, is that what changes uh, will happen to human societal structure if we discover that there's life somewhere else in the universe, or if we discover that there isn't any you know, are, are we completely alone? Are we really unique in the universe or are we abundant? You know, is life abundant? And, and it could be that, you know, that it takes a galaxy to create a sentient society. And maybe there can only be one sentient society in a galaxy, you know, at a given time. And we, we come up over a couple of million years and go away. And then uh, half a billion years later, another one comes up, you know. And it, it, if 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 these things, if if societies like ours, like planets like ours, are really rare, we we're likely to find anything out there. No, I I liked your comment about we're not looking for life; we're looking for what life does. I thought that was that was pretty that was amazing. <laughs> uh, let me see. I've got one more question. I got a raised hand from uh, one of our, our our panel members, Larry Ahern. Larry, do you want to ask your question? No, I just wanted to point out, uh, somebody told me that uh, one of the places that you were uh, calibrating the, uh, the web telescope, when you walk into the door, on the, on the side of the door, there's a sign there, the images you, uh, in this uh, mirror are farther than they seem. A play on the, you know, the thing with you know, automobiles. Yeah. I don't know which one, you've, you've got around to a few of those. I don't know which one that was, so. Yeah, I don't either. I, I have to look again. <laughs> Let me see before we're, since we're already on, I think a couple of people have raised their hands and I might see if we can uh, see who they are so we can turn on their mics maybe. Let me see. <laughs> There's a few more that have stacked up in the Q&A. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, I've got a few. Uh, Dr. Stoll, are you willing to take a few more questions from the oh, audience? Oh, absolutely. And like I said, this is completely normal is that, you know, I typically talk for an hour and I've answered questions up to another hour. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna turn on, I'm gonna allow Blaine to uh, ask a question. So Blaine, uh, let's see, here we go, allow to talk. So Blaine, uh, ask your question, you're, you're muted right now, so you're gonna to have to unmute. Hey, Blaine, you're still muted. You may have stepped away. Yeah, yeah, okay, so let me, Let's do that. Let's. Uh, I saw uh, our, let's see, Adarsh. Uh, let's see, I, I see your hand is up. And uh, let me see if I can allow you to talk and ask a question. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Go ahead and ask your question. I've been, I've done some work 
which is very applicable to what you're just talking about. And that is if the radiation pressure and gravitational attraction on an atom it comes to uh, trying to show that the iron elements of iron atoms will come to the orbit of the earth correct right now is it possible has anybody done that yeah I, i've actually seen lectures on that at uh, the so again I, i'm not an astronomer my phd is in optics but because when i joined nasa i started attending the AAS, american astronomical society so i like to say that my entire graduate level of education in astronomy is from plenary talks at the AAS meetings and a couple of years ago, um, before COVID, the last meeting before COVID, I saw a lecture about this whole thing, about how the gravitational balances between Jupiter and the sun is what is responsible for the, the makeup of our planet, of, of things like, you know, why do we have so much iron? And so okay. you're exactly, you know, yeah, oh, I see that. Hydrogen, hydrogen, more, or he, uh, right. more at certain, certain, certain planets are more hydrogen, more hydrogen there coming to the uh, because the gravitational pull on the atom as well as the radiation pressure pushing it out equal. right yes great i can send it to you if you like if you if i can get your email address <laughs> oh yeah well i'm sure you can get it through bert yep we can do that all right i can do that thank you. very good thank you for the question thank you and uh, let's see, I see uh, Timothy has a question. Timothy, I'm gonna allow you to speak. Okay, your mic is open. Yeah. Would you be able to detect a uh, an object that's about, the, that has the same radius as, roughly the same radius as our, uh, as Earth's orbit from the sun that's approximately at room temperature. I hope, I hope you get where, I'm, get where I'm going with that question. So so that's what the Hubble Exoplanet mission was designed to do, but uh, the Webb telescope's not going to, to be able to do that. The Webb, so, and also we've got this new telescope called the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. It's a, it's a 2.4 meter class telescope, and it's going to be looking at, uh, it'll be able to look at Jupiter class things, uh, Webb oh, no, this probably... is not Jupiter class. This won't be Jupiter. Yeah. I'm, I'm referring more to a Dyson, a Dyson sphere, or swarm. Oh, something that's completely around, uh, like a shell around a star. Yeah, shell or well, a shell or maybe a dense cloud of, I guess, uh, space colonies that's uh, that's that's um, emitting a, a roughly room temperature um, waste heat. So a room temperature waste heat would be something around 10 microns, which, uh, you know, Webb, that would be in the region of Webb. The question is that um, at 10 microns, the, so it, I think it would depend, uh, let me think about this. If, if the shell was blocking enough of the sun's light, if, if the shell was completely, so we have these things, we have these things called uh, hot dogs. Um, hot dust obscured uh, objects, uh, uh, galaxies. So uh, it, it may not be necessarily a man-made kind of thing, but this is something we see all the time is that we see uh, regions in space which are emitting a lot of heat. It could be waste heat at room temperature. And, and so it could have a very strong signature in the infrared, but we don't see any visible light. And the reason we don't see the visible light is because the star is obscured by dust. Um, but you know, but I guess it could also be obscured by some sort of a man-made object or a human or or or, or uh, you know a constructed well, object. A but yeah. Yeah. Well a Dyson swarm would also be producing that waste heat around that temperature as well. Yeah. So we we see objects that are called dust obscured objects that are warm as what you describe. Um, but they're single, they're just single points. You know, we don't have the ability to resolve them. So we don't necessarily know what the cause of why we're seeing an excess of, of thermal heat, waste heat without the starlight. Very good. Uh, let's see, there are a couple more questions I'm gonna take and then we'll call it a night because it's getting late. <laughs> so I see Bill has a question for you. Bill had some really uh, interesting comments in the chat. So let me turn on your mic, Bill. 
There you go. You can talk, Bill. Do y'all turn off my mic? Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Yep, I can turn yours off, Tim. Yep. Okay, thanks, Bert. Um, so, Philip, what uh, what is your um, evaluation of the ultimate sensitivity of an optical instrument? When we were grinding in our own mirrors back in the 60s, we thought one eighth wave was pretty darn good. But now we have such uh, larger aperture instruments. Uh, what do you think? Is there is there an ultimate limit to the to the sensitivity aperture that we can get? Any a practical limit? Uh, time and money. <laughs> That's always a good answer. <laughs> um, so so the other thing is, is stiffness. Is that the um, the Hubble mirror was manufactured to about six nanometers RMS. Uh, smoothness. Um, That's, uh, explain half, RMS, please. R uh, explain root, root mean root mean squared. Right. Root mean squared. Um, it's sort of a, an average roughness, if you will. The the VLT mirrors, the very large telescope mirrors, the Gemini telescope mirrors, the Subaru mirrors. These eight meter class mirrors, we there that are they're they're solid chunks of glass. We can grind and polish them to better than six nanometers over eight meters, which is really exquisite. Um, but a lightweight mirror, a pocketed mirror, uh, it's going to be in the 20 or 30 because the face sheets themselves are not necessarily that stiff. The, the, um, the uh, Habex mirror, the goal was to make it to around uh, uh, 10 nanometers or five nanometers uh, at a four meter class. And, and um, it's again, it's just, just time and money. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for the question, Bill. And uh, I'm going to have the last question tonight comes from uh, Curry. So Curry, I'm going to turn on your mic. You are set to go. And you're on mute right now, Curry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I must have bumped You're good the, now, we hear you. Must have bumped my thing, I didn't have a question. So please get somebody else's question. Oh, you didn't have a question. Okay, any other final questions First, from anyone? Bert, uh, I, see, I see one in the Q&A column that I thought might be uh, interesting to folks. It's from Padraic Shaw. Okay. Will the web do any solar system science? Look at the planets, Kuiper Bell objects, or possibly search for Planet Nine? Um, actually, that's a good question. Uh, in, in the early days of science, we put together, there's, there's a tracking requirement. So web actually has a requirement that it is able to track uh, near, you know, objects that are somewhat nearby. Uh, and in fact, uh, Heidi Hamill at the, uh, um, um, I think she at the Planetary Society, I can't remember where she's at. But yeah, she's a, she's a, a planetary scientist. And, and speaking of NOVA, she's, she, you, she's been on NOVA. And um, so yeah, she's involved in setting up some of the requirements and potentially uh, could use it for doing science. So absolutely. We thought about it. I guess that's where that statistic that NASA loves to put on the crib sheets for people like me in the media came from, which is if the web were on Earth looking at the moon, you could detect the heat from a bumblebee, which I thought was <laughs> pretty imaginative, actually. Yeah. Um, the, the, the other one is that if you want to do exoplanet science, if you want to look at an Earth-like planet around a, a sun-like star, with a telescope located in Los Angeles, it would be like imaging a firefly next to a searchlight on the Empire State Building. <laughs> Pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a billion. It's basically a a, a ten a billion dollars. Uh, an Earth-like planet is a billion times dimmer than its host star. A billion times. Wow. Well, very good. Uh, uh, I think, D Dave, did you have a question before we close out, Dave Dressler? Yeah, thanks, Phil. This has been fascinating. Uh, I really like the uh, fact that rivers of dark matter are where galaxies are born. I had no idea. It's fascinating. But um, it sounds like you're going to be collecting so much data that it's going to be nearly impossible to process it all in real time. And I'm wondering, will the data be shared out through universities and for the general public to analyze and be able to uh, hopefully contribute to uh, the findings? Um, so the, uh, it is NASA policy that the data gets archived in a publicly accessible location. 
and there some of the data will be taken uh, uh, is immediate release, and some of the data that gets taken by the principal. So the the way it's set up is is that the there's a principal investigator for each of the science instruments, and and the principal investigator of the science instrument has rights to his data and he has rights to exclusive use of the telescope and his science instrument for a certain period of time. But then there's this a whole guest observer program in that um, astronomers and astrophysicists from all around the world have submitted proposals to the Space Telescope Institute of, we want to look at this object, we need this uh, that much time. And the, the Space Telescope Institute has put together an incomplete guest observer program of scientists that get to use the telescope, take data, and then their data will again go into the public archive. Um, and then we'll, once we're done with that, somewhere in about six months. Uh, so this, this guest observer proposal process started like six months ago. And in six months from now, we're going to do a whole nother opera, open it up the window and collect a whole bunch more proposals. And so it's, it's going to be um, heavily subscribed and anybody in the world can use it. You just have to write a winning proposal. And, and there is some set aside for citizen science. They're set aside a little bit for you know uh, uh, school age kids. Um, so we, we try as part of the outreach to make it accessible to anybody who's got a good idea. Fantastic, thank you. Very good. With that, I will, that will be our last question. It's been a tremendous presentation. So thank you, Dr. Stahl. I, I think you said you, you said you weren't a scientist, but you sure gave us a lot of great science and a lot of information on the engineering. And we're really looking forward to seeing the results of this amazing uh, space telescope. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And it's, it's my pleasure. And, and I'll, I'll end with this thing. A friend of mine, I got an email from a friend of mine a couple of days ago in Germany, he works for Fraunhofer Institute. And, and he, he, he basically said, thank you for believing it was possible uh, before anybody else did. And, 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 and the other thing I'll share is that I was giving this lecture to a student group at the University of Monterey in Mexico, and I was having breakfast at the local uh, Holiday Inn or Ramad or Hilton, wherever at the hotel I was staying at. And, and a gentleman came up to me at breakfast and said, you know, I can tell you're, you're an American, you, you know, and what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm giving this lecture on, on the Webb telescope. And he said, I worked on that program. He got really excited and, and animated. And so I asked him about it, and that he was basically, he's basically a salesman for a, a CNC machining company in the Bay Area. And he wrote some code for a CNC machine to make a part for the structure. And, and here is this, this guy who, who is so far removed from what is just completely invested in that there are literally tens of thousands of people that have worked on the Webb telescope all around the world. I think, you know, 14 countries, 29 different states. I, I've had the privilege of being working on it, you know, uh, since 1999. I was one of the first dozen people to work on the program. And, and you know, you get a little bit, you lose, you lose that, that you know that that sense of awe i think when you're in in so close to something right and and it's just like the media is asking me you know are you nervous and i and i thought well maybe i would be but turn, i i'm not nervous i i have got so much confidence it's going to work that you know the only thing i was really kind of nervous about was the rocket getting off the ground and uh but you know, and, and I've interviewed, uh, did an interview in Madison, Wisconsin, and there's a company in Wisconsin that, that made the, the, one of the adhesives. And it doesn't matter, you know, how small your contribution was to this, but literally thousands and thousands of people have made contributions to make this telescope possible. And every one of those contributions is important. Absolutely. I, I always like that number where they say 400,000 people helped get us to the moon. So maybe we need to get that acne, that number for how many people contributed to the Webb Space Telescope. A fa a fabulous, fabulous technological achievement. So we're looking forward to it. So again, thank you for taking all the extra time too. Uh, and we really appreciate that. Uh, I would like to just say some other thank yous to everybody. I'd like to thank uh, Robin Scott from the Huntsville L5 Society uh, and for really helping us get this meeting arranged. It was a uh, it was great, fabulous. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, I would like to thank, say thanks to our CEO, Anita Gale, 
uh, who is still on, and I, our president, Michelle Hanlon, had to leave. Uh, so thank you both for your welcoming remarks. Uh, thanks to Aggie Cobrin for her talk about what's happening on Sunday. So hopefully you can join us uh, for the Sunday event. Uh, and thank you, Rod, for, for uh, doing a great job in assisting me with moderating. And from the tech side, I want to thank Dave Dressler and also Fred Becker. Uh, always make sure that these events go off well. And of course, my other colleague, Larry Ahern, uh, who helps organize the Space Forum. So, so thank you all. It's been just a fabulous night. So I'm just going to share my screen one last time uh, as we close out. Uh, so for everyone who's joined us and who's still on tonight, uh, I just want to say thank you for attending. Uh, it's been great. We're great to get the uh, 2022 Space Forums going again. And so have a great evening if you're in this time zone, uh, a great day if you're in tomorrow's time zone, and have a great weekend and remember to stay safe. So wishing everyone a good evening and thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Bye.